special broadcast taken from one of Lance's most recent appearances. Tune in and get ready for some major revelation. I started this business, this media company, because when the Lord told me that um, he was going after all seven mountains, I was over in the church mountain. I left the whole system. I left the wealth of corporate America to go all the way over here into the church world where I was convinced, I told Kim Clement, what we're going to do is we're going to break through the devils trying to block the church. And when we break through, boom, it's going to change everything. Well, what I didn't realize when I was saying that is I had a separate, this was my vision with Kim traveling with him. We'd break through here. And then I'm starting to see that there's other realms over here. So when I, uh, I was up at Trump Towers, to be honest with you, what happened was I get a call from Paula White's producer inviting me to go to Trump Towers. My secretary at that time said, Dr. Lance, you're going to fire me. I go, why am I going to fire you? She goes, you're going to be so mad when you hear this. I go, what? Because Kim used to prophesy who the next president was. He prophesied Obama. He prophesied. He was very good in that. And he and I were not involved with politics. We were just involved with predicting what would happen. And he'd have crazy prophecies, and my job was to explain the most crazy ones. So he'd call me up and tell me, hey, I'm getting this, I'm getting this. He gives me a date, and I'd figure out what it was, and I'd help backfill the prophetic. So we worked great as a team. I love being with him. And uh, Kim and I were invited to Trump Towers to go meet with Trump. And she called my secretary and says, I got the call on the answering machine, and I haven't played the answering machine for two weeks. The event is tomorrow. And I never RSVP that you would attend. I'd understand if you fire me. I go, you're telling me you got a call two weeks ago to meet with Trump, the apprentice guy? Like, at that time, it was Mr. Trump. Donald Trump wasn't president. And Kim's going? Dang. So Kim calls me up. He says, I'll I'll meet you up there. We're going to stay at the Q Hotel. He tells you where the hotel is. He wants to go because he already had his favorite place to go. I said, call him up and see if I can still go. So she did, and she called me back. She said, I'll get you a ticket right now. I got your ticket. You're going to fly in tomorrow. You can still go into the meeting. I said, oh, my gosh, this is so weird. I get there. I almost never went. Show you how close you can come to missing the trapeze act in your destiny. I'm up there, and Ferguson is burning. It's all kinds of Democrats now are doing this weird thing where they're having these, these planting people that would be violent at meetings in order to create the branding of Trump as a racist. Understand how how spiritually sophisticated this political warfare is. And where it's like, I was ignorant of it. I didn't didn't know one party from the other, frankly. So uh, I'm up there. And Donald Trump is talking about Ferguson's burning, Baltimore's burning. And he says, personally, I think this is mostly economic. I believe the greatest problem is these places are tinderboxes. It's a wonder that all more cities aren't on fire. We have got to shift the economy around so that people have hope. Young black men have to be able to have jobs that are prospering. I'm a business guy. I can turn the economy around. I can fix this situation. If they give me a shot, I know how to make money flow, and I'm going to change these cities. That was his vision. So far from a racist vision. And, uh, and the meeting's going on, and, and the pastors, of course, are talking irrelevant things. Well, you have to deal with homosexuality. He's like staring at him like, my God, I'm trying to save your country. You got North Korea wants to get a nuclear war. You got the economy at that point, $22 trillion in debt. Cities are burning and the pastors are upset about homosexuals. I'm thinking, oh, dear God, we sound so out of touch. But Trump's listening uh, respectfully. Then he says, are you aware of the fact that I'm in Manhattan? Do you understand how weird it is that I'm a conservative in Manhattan? He goes, I'm like totally like an isolated species in New York. Nobody in my city believes what I believe. And I got more in common with you than you know. Because I have an affection for Billy Graham and the era when Christianity shaped America. And he said, if you don't mind me saying so, I think you guys have gotten soft. And then all the pastors are staring at him. He said... I mean, not you, we, we, me too, like me, me and you, we. But he had already blown it then. He said, he said you, and then he tried to make it me, we, you know, like, yeah, I'm, I'm one of you. And I'm sitting there going, Lord, I don't get it. What am I doing here? I know I teach Seven Mountains. You call me out of the business world. 
into the church. I'm doing the best I can to explain how the system actually works. But what am I doing here? I'm not involved with race. I'm not involved with economics. I'm not involved with politics. I'm not involved with any of the issues these people are talking about. I'm not even involved with the homosexual issue. I'm in my own prophetic category of revival, awakening, traveling with Kim, and seven mountains. You know what the Lord said to me? Every time you pray in tongues, you tell me this is what you want to do. Now listen to what I just said. Every time you, how did I end up at Trump's table? My tongues got me there. My head did not even know what I was doing there. Every time you pray in tongues, you're telling me this is what you want to do. I was totally confused. I said, how can my tongues be taking me someplace I don't even know anything about and don't want to do? Well, there's lesson number one. Your spirit prayeth, not your head. And your spirit knoweth where you're supposed to go in. I was totally unequipped for this experience. I turned around to the guy, doorman, actually, when I got there. I said, hey, I'm a little nervous here. Kenneth Copeland, here's um, owners of TBN, Paul White. I, these, are all, these are all like mega church. These are TV preachers. Paul is entourage. I ain't one of them. I go, the door guy's got a clipboard. He goes, yeah, you're on the list. I go, well, how do you know? Just check, double check. I was feeling like self-conscious. You're on the list because I put you on the list. I said, you put me on the list? I thought it was a doorman who worked at Trump Towers. He said, I'm Paula White's producer. And I heard you once at this really odd meeting in a warehouse in Florida. And I remember the meeting. Rick Joyner is a friend of mine. Rick Joyner said, Michael Illich of the famous, like, you know, Illich family. They own the Detroit Tigers and Little Caesars Pizza, billionaire family. He wants to meet with you at this meeting in Florida. I highly recommend that you go. I said, well, I'll meet a billionaire anytime. So <laughs> I get on my little plane. I go flying. I end up in a warehouse with a whiteboard on a rickety stage with all metal chairs. You know those chairs that really make your butt hurt after like a half an hour. And they're really noisy too. So it's like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I'm looking around and Mike never showed up. Mike didn't make it to the meeting. On the way home, the devil took the seat next to me on my little commercial flight, bouncing around up there at 30,000 feet, praying that I land. And the devil says to me, what are you doing with your life? You don't fit in the church world. You don't fit in the marketplace because you're too into Jesus. You're too into Jesus. Too. You don't fit anywhere. Why don't you make a choice? It was tormenting me. And all that flashed back to me. So I realized that guy who put me in front of Trump was sitting there in that audience. He said to me, remember this one crazy meeting you did at this warehouse in Florida? I heard you there when you, I went down to hear you. He said, you know what the Lord told me? I'm to get you in front of Trump. He put me in that meeting. At a meeting that I thought I was losing my mind even going to in Florida. What happens if a natural disaster takes place, we have these weird tornadoes that hit in the Midwest and in Texas, but look at the hurricanes in Florida. People can literally have their uh, houses flooded or they're in a situation where they have no food or access to groceries. Everyone needs at least a four week emergency food kit. And fortunately, My Patriot Supply has created a four week emergency kit. And these products will last for 25 years. The interesting thing is they give you a 2000 calorie per day a meal, and that's the key. Delicious and 2,000 calories a day, because that's what you're gonna need to sustain yourself for four weeks in a crisis. We had the uh, a winter freeze here in Texas of all places, and we had a couple of days where we had no electricity. I'm telling you something, this makes a huge difference. Mushroom rice pilaf, fluffy rice and mushrooms, seasoned with red wine and herb. And then how about starting the day off? Maple Grove oatmeal, old fashioned oats, maple flavoring, with a pinch of brown sugar. This is what you want to do. Four week emergency food kit. And that's just for you. Think about your children. Guarantee somebody around you is going to need help. You're going to want to at least have the four week emergency kit. Go to lancewalla.com forward slash patriot. Use that link and you're going to get a special discount on their special four week emergency kit promotion.
So he kicks my chair, bam, during the meeting there. When I'm, I'm going, what am I doing here? And the Holy Ghost says, every time you're praying, something's supposed to be here. And he leans over to me and says, say something. <laughs> I've been through a lot of stress, people. <laughs> say something. He goes, you're supposed to be here. God told me to put you here. <laughs> say something. So I'm here. I Listen, I am the Holy Ghost chair kicker in your life right now. I've been sent here to tell you that you may not feel like you fit. You might know where you fit. You might not understand what you're doing. This is, a, this is not a packed out house. I'm not used to preaching with, with a select group, but I've learned something. When it's a select group, and I learned this from Rick Joyner. He said, Jesus' most important sermon, he delivered to two men on the road to Emmaus. So I look and I go, well, I'm here because somebody's here. This must be the warehouse meeting. I'm here to give you a kick in the chair, to tell you that God's going to take you to places you don't think you belong in, and when you get there, you'll remember my word. What am I doing here? And I'll tell you, as, as confident as you are, God will put you at a table where you're not confident. Because that's when you know he's going to get the glory. It's not going to be you talking about how you did this and you did that. God didn't get glory from you crowing about your great decision-making and favor force. He gets glory out of you telling your screw-ups and your marginal misses yeah. where he showed up and put you over the top. Yeah. So he kicks me in the chair, and I, I only knew one thing. I knew from a guy named Mark Duddle, who I talked to, who's a brilliant economist, served with Milton Friedman, worked in the Reagan administration. I listen, I listen, I take notes. This is another thing. You're never in the wrong place. You may not know why you're there, but you don't have to murmur and complain just say, Lord, there's a reason I'm here. Because if you'll be receptive and teachable, God will give you a golden nugget you'll tuck away and use it later. I even heard sermons that were so bad, I said, what am I doing here? The Lord said, you're sitting in the sanctuary where I told you to go. Now, get your pen out. I'm about to give you a download. And while the preacher's talking, I'm getting a whole book outline right there. The Lord said, just be receptive and obedient, and I'll meet you where I send you. So I'm talking to this economist, Milton Friedman changed the company, and he tells me something. There's 30 million small businesses in America, 70% of the employable workforce is actually employed by small businesses. That's the, that's the Chick-fil-A's and the Subway uh, hoagie places. It's not the big Wall Street corporations. That's 30% of the economy. 70% is local small businesses. Most of them are franchised. 30 million. Small businesses in America account for 70% of the employment. Here's a funny thing. This is the only thing I could think of saying when I get kicked in the chair, which is hilarious because I'm about to discuss with Donald Trump an economic concept in a room full of preachers, which only makes me weirder because most of them don't know what the heck I'm talking about. I sound like an alien. But here's what happens. Boom, kick in the chair. Trump is saying, have you noticed how Bill Maher is making fun of you guys all the time? And he just got done saying, you don't mind me saying so, you've gotten soft. And, uh, I mean, we, we've gotten soft. And I yell out. I go, yeah! Everybody turns like that. Because I kept getting kicked in the chair, and I didn't want to disappoint the guy that brought me to the meeting. I say, yeah, 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 and... There's 30 million small businesses in the United States. One third of them are owned by Christians. Did you know that? 10 million small businesses are in the United States owned by believers who want freedom from the system. They want prosperity and they are people of faith. They have faith, family values, autonomy and independence. That means there's 10 million small businesses in America. And the average number of employees is anywhere from three to five. That means there's 30 to 50 million people just looking for somebody to bring them together in the marketplace because 30 to 50 million people will vote in and make a president happen if they can only reflect the values and the priorities of an independent small business owner who are the most neglected people because everybody focuses on Wall Street, nobody focuses on Main Street. And by the way, I shouted out, the single largest factor within that sector of 10 million small businesses is over 10% of them are owned by African-American minorities that know that apart from music or sports, 
Entrepreneurism is the way out of poverty. And into wealth. I got done delivering my Professor Harold Hill Music Man speech. Trump's staring at me. Everybody's staring at me like I'm from a foreign planet. And I thought, dear God, what am I doing here? Because Trump had his own strategy. It was better than mine. He was going to reach into the Rust Belt and get all the Democrat laborers. He was going to get all the voting Democrats to vote for him because he's the only guy who wants to bring manufacturing back. His, his plan is stop China from undercutting us with billions of dollars. Put tariffs. He's playing, you know, Major League Ball. I'm still, I'm still playing, you know, a, a lesser game. I have a great theory, but it's not what he was going to do. So when it was all over, I thought, man, that's embarrassing. He didn't even, nobody, nobody, nobody knew what I was talking about, except for one guy who was, who was Bishop Daryl Scott. Daryl Scott invites me back. He comes, pulls me aside. He goes, nobody else heard what you said, but I heard what you said. What you said about African Americans is so true. It's going to be, I'm in charge of Trump's coalition for diversity. I want to see business. I want to see that as a priority. I want to see the inner city economic revitalization. You and I are going to talk tomorrow. You're the strategist. I go, who are you? He goes, I'm Daryl Scott. I'm going to be in charge of his diversity committee or whatever. I go, well, I'm not quite sure I belong here, but nice to meet you. So I took off. I don't want to spend the whole night telling you stories like this. But I go home. You can take this for what it's worth. I have no interest in politics. I have no interest in Donald Trump. I'm not a fire-breathing conservative. I didn't really even understand how politics worked. I didn't go there. I was in Southern Mountain Land and Revival Land and Prophetic Land. But after that trip, I come home. And I realized Kim didn't make it to the meeting. Kim had a stroke. Kim was in the hospital. I'm on the phone. Where the heck was Kim? I mean, I'm sitting there like in that meeting. I thought I was going to hear, he's going to discern what happens. He and I would do a little radio, TV interview or, or a social media interview and talk about what he heard God say about Trump. He'll prophesy what's going on with Trump and I don't have to worry about it. Well, Kim wasn't there. So I'm calling Jane. I'm finding out what's happening to my friend. I can't believe he's in the hospital. We're the same age. Our birthday's only two weeks apart. I go, dang. Whew, I'm all shook up and praying for him. And I'm sitting down. And his gift hasn't happened a lot, but it happens now and then. You know, if you hang out with somebody, it's like Benny Hinn wasn't really that close to Catherine Kuhlman, never even met her, but he was in the choir the day when the Holy Ghost jumped on him. He was close enough in proximity to catch it. So, oh, I'm sitting there. Kim and I are joking around every night. We're, we're seeing these stupid uh, YouTubes with each other. We're doing like videos and changing our face and our voice, really adolescent. But we'd be laughing and giggling in bed right until he had that stroke. I, this is where I was going to meet him up in New York. And, I, and he wasn't responding to my goofy videos. And I found out, oh, he's in the hospital. I sit down and his gift, boom, drops on me. And here's what happens. I hear like a ticker tape in my left ear. The next president of the United States is going to be an Isaiah 45 president. Isaiah 45, president, the next president of the United States. I'm thinking, what in the world, man? I'm hearing voices saying the next president's going to be Isaiah 45. The 45th president. The 45th president will be an Isaiah 45 president. It keeps coming. Isaiah 45, 45th president. I go, dear God, the Bible says try the spirits, whether they be of God. I'm hearing a demon as sure as anything. I never, because I never heard God that clear. Sorry to say. So I said, I'm going to try the spirits, whether they be of God. My God, what's going on with me? So I go to my Google. I go, okay, Lord, let's go test that spirit. What number is the next president of the United States? And it says, well, President Obama was 44, and he was real. I said, but he was reelected, so he was 44 and 45. And I said, no, no, whatever the president's number is when he goes in, he keeps it, regardless of how many years he's reelected. He was 44 twice. The next president of the United States will be 45. I'm going, oh, my God, I'm hearing a voice. I flip open my, uh, my, my internet, and there, boom, like Jeremiah Johnson sends me this weird picture of Donald Trump, you know, smiling with a thumbs up saying, Donald Trump, uh, President of the United States. I go, Trump? Because he's still the apprentice. I just left New York watching the, you know, he's a celebrity TV star. Getting, I was, you know, I think it's Cruz or Ben Carson or Huckabee. And I mean, my God, we got so many Christians running. Surely God isn't going to choose a heathen. God is much more religious than that. Next thing you know, that voice gets me again. 
common grace. Common grace. I hear the word common grace. I'm going, oh man, I'm hearing stuff. This is weird. Like, I, if, if this isn't you, Lord, then it's like, I got to clean my house out, do some Halloween clean, cleansing in my home. I go to Isaiah 45, flip it open. Isaiah 45, 45th president. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, whom I've anointed, you will go through the two leaf gates of Babylon on dry ground. You will undo the belts of adversaries. You will break the bars of iron. And all this I will do for my people's sake, though you do not even know me. That's the Bible. I read that and I said, dang. Thus says the Lord to my anointed Cyrus, who doesn't even know him. I never once heard Benny Hinn teach that message. I always heard about the anointing. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't move. Don't do sneeze. Don't, don't throw off the miracle service. I'm thinking, oh, the sacred spirit. Here he's talking about God actually putting an anointing on someone who doesn't know him. This is messing my whole theology. I'll go back and read it in another translation. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, whom I have anointed. You are my shepherd. And now Israel's looking for a messianic. I catch it. Israel, my Jewish forefathers, were looking for one of their people to be the messianic deliverer. Surely the Lord will raise up a Mike Pence. Surely the Lord will raise up a Ted Cruz. Surely the Lord will raise up a Ben Carson. Surely he'll raise up a God-fearing evangelical. And God says, I'm just going to test your discerning and your religious capacity. I'm going to pick the heathen from Queens. He's going to be like Samson. He's going to slay more Philistines than any of these other guys can do. And God puts his anointing on him. Well, I was stunned. Because now I'm getting advanced revelation on a subject that's going to put me in the political crosshairs of everybody because everyone else running is a Christian except Trump. How am I going to deliver that message? That's why I'm telling you. I don't speak as pleasing men, but God's paying the bills. So I started a secular company because I was told right away by my friend Mark Nuttall who gave me that economic advice. He said... Brother, you start talking the way you're talking. I appreciate it. Most preachers will hide behind that tax exemption. They won't go there. Most of they don't want to offend, they don't want to get in trouble with the African American community. If, they, if they, that's their constituency, they're going to shut up. And they're all going to talk about how they don't want to get involved with politics. They're going to preach the kingdom. So if I was you, I'd get ready to get audited because the government is a, is a weaponized system. You're tangling with a bigger principality than you know. They're going to now come after you. I said, well, Lord, what am I supposed to do? I don't want to be controversial. I even don't want to get involved with politics. But I do want to be faithful in speaking what you show me. And evidently my tongues are praying something. And so I started a secular business. I figured, you know what, most sheep, most Christians are too polite. You see... The Davids that God raises up are the ones that take out the Goliaths. That's a different kind of sheep. That's not a passive sheep, a domestic sheep, a sleeping sheep. That's what you call a killer sheep. It's the ones that God raises up to take out strongholds. And they're in the Bible. So I uh, started a media company called Killer Sheep Media. It's a secular company so that I would never be accused of violating my tax exemption because I'm not preaching as a preacher. I'm now giving my opinion as a tax-paying citizen. <laughs> and this year, the reason why you can take my advice on business is I think we just uh, passed the, uh, the Inc. 2000. We just crossed the $2 million mark on my media company. Two million dollars of profitability from a preacher who went there because I was not going to be silent when the devil told me to shut up. Hallelujah. And that company will go to four million and five and ten million, short order. Because I totally believe that God wants us to be a voice in this generation and he does not want us to uh, compromise our witness or, or pit where we're going. You know, what does the Bible say in James? Warning about this person that says we're going to go here or go there and make a profit. The Lord says, you don't know what's going to happen. 
What you want to do is you want to be led where the Spirit of God is taking you. The word the Lord gave me for this year is 2 Corinthians chapter, I guess it's chapter uh, 16, verse. It says, uh, For a great and effectual door is open unto me in Ephesus, and there are many adversaries. The Lord said, Tell my people if they have the courage to do like you've done, they're going to find the open doors that other people are afraid to go through. And the reason why they're afraid is because they're looking at the enemies at the gates. The Lord said, don't focus on the enemies, focus on the open door. And then the Lord gave me this piece yesterday. He gave it for you. I mean, I'm flying down to talk to you. Obviously, this is why I'm here. And the Lord says to me, see, now tell them, this is from another preacher last night. They were just, just teaching me something. They said, you realize that you want to, because I'm getting hit by Rolling Stone. I'm getting hit by Carl Reiner has a movie. Rob Reiner has a movie about me this year. They're going to label me, slander me. It's like, you know, like, like, like the apostle said, I'm controversial. I'm not. I'm just, you've heard everything about me right now. This is not controversial if you're hearing me. But if you've got a devil, then I sound dangerous. Because I'm not fitting the normal cubbyhole they like to stick preachers in. So... They follow me like a hawk. Rolling Stone does hit pieces on me. Now they got a movie and they're focusing on me. And I said, Lord, I was, you know, relatively unknown. Most people don't know who I am. I actually was, after, you know, after a while, I was kind of like enjoying the anonymity because I don't have, at least I don't have all my enemies out there knowing I am. But here's the weird thing. The devil knows who's anointed to do him damage. And for those of you that are anointed to do the devil damage, God's going to give you an open door, and there are many adversaries. Here's the secret. Make sure that you've dealt with your flesh. We're all opportunists till we put it to death. We're all saying, oh, I'm generous. I'm going to give to the kingdom. Well, let me tell you something. If you're not giving now, you're not giving then. Well, I don't know, preacher. I'm having a hard time right now. Let me tell you something. If you can't, God can't trust you with 10 pennies and a dollar. When you're struggling for a tank of gas, he can't trust you with a million out of ten. So, as they're attacking me, which worse is when the preachers do it. I can handle Rolling Stone. I can handle Rob Runner. I can handle the leftists. I realize they're deranged and they need Jesus. It's when the preachers start coming after you. Who? that's a special test. Lord said, just make sure you go to the open door and you let me go through it first. Because if you get in front of me, all those arrows are going to hit you. You let me go first and I'll let them hit me. They ain't going to touch you. Go in the spirit, not in the natural. So we're going to have to learn how to float around in the spirit and not in the natural this year. It's going to be a fun year. Open doors, many adversaries, and then God's going to be delivering nations. I wanted to take a minute to talk about one of my great heroes of the faith, which is Mike Lindell. What's really cool about Mike is it's not just the pillow. It's the fact that the guy makes really cool products. For instance, I start my day off with a my coffee. I had a cup of coffee uh, the other day here in the office, and I said, no, I want that. It wasn't like Starbucks. It tastes better. And it was Mike's coffee. I said, what is it? They go, Mike Lindell's coffee. I said, my gosh, get a bunch of my coffees. Now, the best way to start the day is you put on these slippers, right? And have your my coffee. If you've not worked with these slippers yet, I'm not kidding you. There's a special kind of a design that Mike has uh, put into these with four layers of cushion with a solid sole and a fur interior. I call it my sip and slip strategy. I start my day off by slipping on my slippers and having a sip of Mike's coffee. But you know what else I'm curious about now? Because I've got to check out the 2.0 pillow. The 2.0 pillow actually is designed so that it distributes the heat of your own head, your face. You know, you're lying there. And it, it uh, makes it so the pillow's always cool. Now, I like that because I wake up in the middle of the night and have to flip over my pillow because it gets hot. Mike's solved that problem. I want you to go to MyPillow.com, promo code Lance, because you can get a discount that I've set up for the pillows, for the coffee, and uh, for the slippers. And do it today. You'll be happy. 
Did you enjoy this latest episode? Please remember to share it with your friends, because the more knowledge you have, the better equipped you are to navigate the world.